For Inside Carolina, I'm Taylor Vipolis, and you're listening to this podcast, which is a part of the Inside Carolina Podcast Network. On today's episode, I'm joined by my fellow Carolina football letterman, Mike Ingersoll and EJ Wilson, to talk about Carolina's latest game against Miami, where the Tar Heels came out with a win. Before we get started, though, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Be sure you subscribe to Inside Carolina wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube so you never miss out on any of the content the team at IC puts out. The support doesn't go unnoticed on this end. Speaking of support, we want to support the people that support us. So that's why I've got to mention our friends over at Johnny T-Shirt. When it comes to the Carolina apparel, they have everything you could possibly want. They have the football T-shirts, the jerseys, the hats, you name it, they probably have it. Basketball season's about to get started. They have all the basketball gear, the cold weather's coming, cold weather gear. It's about to be the holiday season. So get a little head start on everybody else and go to Johnny T-Shirt. It's great people, great customer service since it's locally owned and operated by alumni. And don't forget, Inside Carolina premium subscribers get 10% off their orders. All right. As always, it's Mike Ingersoll, EJ Wilson, guys, Carolina, back in the win column. It's the fifth straight week where you get the alternating wins and losses. Uh, the Tar Heels beat the Hurricanes 45-42, uh, uh, an up-and-down game that had a thrilling ending similar to the Duke game uh, a couple of years ago where you get the, the, the interception uh, when the other team's in the red zone when, with a chance to tie and the team doesn't even get the attempt to kick the field goal and Carolina – Gets a big win over Manny Diaz and the Hurricanes. Mike, what were your biggest takeaways from this game? Uh, same as same as every week up till now. Honestly, I mean, we we improved on some things. We regressed in some other areas, and there are still some some problem areas we got to clean up, um, particularly on the offensive line, which obviously is what I'm going to talk about at length. But um, you know, Sam, I, I still I, I swear, and I hope I'm not right about this. I, that that kid is that kid's going to get hurt this year if we don't keep him off the ground. I mean, he's, he's trying to, I mean, he's, he's got to do everything. He he's got to do everything for the offense already. So he is our second leading rusher. Uh, he, I don't think he passed Ty Chandler at this point, but I think he's probably close as I, uh, the announcer said as, as the game started that he was, I think within a hundred yards of, of tying as the leading rusher for the team. I, that typically shouldn't happen. Although in modern college football offenses, I don't think it's abnormal for some teams. This is, we are not one of those teams. We are not one of those teams where our second leading rusher should be the quarterback. Um, you know, obviously his passing numbers and his passing touchdowns are taking a hit for that too. But what you're also seeing is that, you know, he's, he's rushing things. Um, his timing is still off. And a lot of that I think has to do with the fact that he's getting hit every other play or he's in danger of getting hit every other play. Uh, Twist beat us again. You know, in Miami, for as long as they've existed, has been, you know, the kind of team that will forecast their twists. And Jason Staples and I did this, did a rundown on this uh, in the film room. Uh, so if you had a chance to go look at it, you know, go look at it. But we watched it with, the, with respect to Florida State and their defensive line. Uh, Miami has always tipped their twists and tipped their games up front on the defensive line to the point of that they literally talk to each other before we'd snap the pl- before we'd snap the ball and 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 ask each other what the other guy was going to do in front of us. So like Miami is not there's no trickeration with Miami. There, there there's no there's there's nothing stealth about Miami's schemes up front. Um, we st- and where that frustrates me is that we still struggle to pick some pretty simple stuff up. Um, that resulted in plays either getting blown up, getting disrupted, or Sam getting hit. And we have to, we got to put a stop to that. Um, you know, the good news is a win is a win. Positivity pod, win is a win. Um, but we're not out of, we're not out of October yet. You know, we currently have one more win in the month of October than I thought we were going to have. Um, I am not confident that that number is going to change. But positivity pod, Sundays feel better after a win. Uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll get in, we'll break down the film this week as a, as a crew, as a staff, the team will break down the film this week. We'll obviously have more throughout the week to talk about with this, but um, you know, a win is a win is a win. Don't apologize for a win, but it wasn't, it wasn't clean and it wasn't pretty. Yeah. I thought you made an interesting point with Sam Howell too, where, you know, the offensive line has struggled at times. The receivers have struggled at times uh, creating separation, but 
you know, he is taking a, a ton of hits and you have to kind of wonder how that's affecting his whole process when the first two years he didn't have to run as much as he's being relied upon now to run. And I think that's just another thing you have to kind of consider when you're talking about, you know, where, where is Sam Howell at? Because for when you're watching this team, you could say Sam Howell has struggled or you could say he hasn't been as good as the, the past two years. This is still a team where if you don't have Sam Howell, I would not want to see how this team does because he's being asked to do a ton for this offense. And he, he for the most part, he, he is carrying this team to uh, a lot of good performances. But EJ, what about you? What were your biggest takeaways? Uh, number one, um, I don't think that our defensive performance was as bad as the a score reflects. I actually think that we played a really good game. I mean, from the beginning on, I mean, you could see, I, I honestly think this is probably the best our defensive line has played in a couple of years as a unit. I mean, they really control the line of scrimmage for the most part of the game. I'll say for 75% of the game, they, they basically control the line of scrimmage they got after the quarterback. So that was really good to see. I think what we really struggled was our secondary as a whole, whether it was the, the pass interference and holding calls on Tony Grimes or the missed tackle, missed tackles by Kyler McMichael, uh, one for a big gain and set up a touchdown, another four touchdowns. So I just think that that really kind of hindered us from really putting together a total defensive game. And, and, and that leads to my second point when talking about Kyler McMichael, my third point. The missed tackles just showed up over and over again. As the game went on and it looks like maybe the guy started to get fatigued, the missed tackles just start popping up again. And I mean, and they were in very important situations and very and critical situations, like on third downs. I mean, I mean, on big gains, turning a two yard gain or a loss into a three or four yard gain, those things start to add up. And I think we started to see that in the second half when they were scoring more points. Um, but I, being the positivity pod, I think I want to end my takeaways with, with the play of Cedric Gray and Miles Murphy. Cedric Gray was all over the field. I mean, whether it was interceptions, whether it was tackle for loss, whether it was just being in the right place at the right time and showing the speed. I mean, I, I made one note where, I mean, I, I think he had, it was a wheel router. He was covering the wide receiver all the way down the field and broke up the play, pass in the end zone. I mean, how often do you see linebackers doing that? Second of all, how often do you see young linebackers doing that? They have the discipline to keep their eyes on their luggage and have the athleticism to be able to cover them down the field. And, and Miles Murphy, I mean, I remember texting Mike on this one play uh he absolutely destroyed the guard i mean i think without hands to the face he still destroys that guy like that because he continued to do that all game and i mean you just saw his physicality i mean yeah he had a couple tackles for loss in the sack but i think his impact in the game goes far beyond the stat sheet the jeremiah gimmel and cedric gray were able to able to uh, flow so freely and play the way that they played because he was eating up uh, offensive linemen whether they were trying to double team him, triple team him, or whether he was just getting knocked back and disrupting the play as a whole i mean and my, my Mike will tell you if there's a defensive lineman that's doing that, whether he's making a tackle or not, that's going to be your MVP for the day because the offense mm -hmm. can't the offense can't do what they want to do if they can't move the middle of the line of scrimmage. So I mean, hats off. I mean, a lot of guys played well. Of course, Ray Vahasic played well. Jeremiah Gimmel played well, and I mean, Jaquarius Conley is really looking like an all ACC player back there at safety. We got some big plays from Cam Kelly. So I think the guys that we've been waiting to see play well all year did, and maybe it has something to do with those player only meetings that they held um i'm thinking that that had a lot to do with it so hopefully this can kind of carry over and we can really put some games together and not kind of finish the game the way we did i mean i mean it was all it was awesome to get that interception to finish the game i think that really was a statement but let's let, let's kind of cut out some of that stuff in the middle let, let's put together a complete 100 percent game instead of 80 percent. well the big problem i think was a lot i mean we had 100 some odd yards and penalties too yeah, most yeah. of those were on the defensive side of the ball. Most of them were pass interference or defensive holding calls, and a lot of those pass interference calls were in the end zone or in the red zone. Yeah, I mean, you just you can't have that. You know, you're, you're, you're setting up Miami for easy scores. I mean, the pick six on the bubble route didn't didn't help um, from the offensive side of the ball. But I mean, there there, there was there were way too many penalties, and there's blame to go around to everybody on this. I mean, it wasn't just the defense. We just you know there there were the, the bigger penalties happened on defense, but there were holding calls, and I seen Richards was offsides a couple times, I think, or at least once you know, in big situations taking it, you know, and then we had, you know, major sacks getting us, taking us out of field goal range. So you had penalties and you had lost yardage plays that really, you know, put the defense on their heels. So I agree with you that the defensive performance was a lot better than the final score indicated. Um, the offense put them in bad spots. You know, we, mm -hmm. we scored 45 points on offense, but, you know, we really only put together one and arguably maybe two drives that were impressive. 
you know, that really ate up clock and, and were methodical and did what you needed to do to get the defense some rest. You know, the rest of the points were all quick hitters, big plays, good, starting with good field position, thanks to the defense. Um, you know, you can't expect your defense to be out there playing 65, 70% of the time, and they're not going to get tired. Uh, they had opportunities, you know, uh, Don Chapman had a dropped interception that that drive ultimately led to, was it a touchdown or a field? It led to points. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that would have put a stop to that drive, obviously right there, given the offense great field position, at least probably would have scored three points on that. So, you know, maybe you never even get to 45 to 42, maybe, you know, maybe it's 52 to, you know, 38 or something at the end of that game. And it looks like a totally different football game from a win loss standpoint or from a, you know, from a win standpoint, like it just looks like a better win, but if it were 52 to 38 versus 45 to 42, I'm with you. I don't think the defensive performance would have been any different. It wouldn't have been any better. Wouldn't have been any worse under those circumstances. You know, the point differential was not the indicator of how well I thought the defense played. That being said, I've said it before. We shouldn't need to score 50 points to beat a team, but in modern college football, I guess, you know, maybe you do. <laughs> you do more often than not, I guess. Because yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. My my biggest takeaways before I get into the questions is that uh, I I didn't leave that game feeling more encouraged for the the end of the year with Carolina um, needing to win another game against one of these ranked teams coming down the stretch. Um, just just because I I feel like Miami. Uh, that quarterback, he, he just doesn't really have the, the talent necessary to kind of take full advantage of, of where Carolina's defense is going to make mistakes. It's, it's the sending people out of the backfield. It seems like once every few drives, uh, somebody is just running completely unmarked out of the backfield. And when, when you compound that with missed tackles, it, it becomes a problem and those plays start to break out for, um, bigger yards. So I think I'm, I'm a little hesitant to think that this team is turning a corner just because, just because of the same issues we've kind of seen all year and how much Carolina is relying on Sam Howell. And I think the, I think adding the run game has been a great addition to this offense. It's, it's Sam Howell is a gamer. He's going to fight for every yard he can, even though the coaches are telling him slide, get down, get down. Um, but I, I'm still worried that the creativity to get others involved in this offense just isn't there too much. I do like how Carolina was able to establish the run game, but when you have one target for every receiver, not named Josh Downs, I think you're starting in the, in the second half. I think Miami did a lot better job bracketing Josh Downs and realizing that Downs is one of the, the few guys that can beat you. And I think that was, besides the fact that Miami was down and they needed points, I think that was one of the reasons why Miami um, was able to put together a better second half performance because in the first half they came out and they were like, our athletes are better than your athletes. We're going to go man to man on Josh Downs and, that is about as big a mistake as you can make right now in college football with the way Josh Downs plays. So I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant still to think that um, this team is going to turn it around, especially when you have a team like Notre Dame, Notre Dame's not the same Notre Dame team, but you know, they still have a ton of talent, Wake Forest, uh, Sam Hartman. I think Sam Hartman's going to be one of the best quarterbacks Carolina plays all year. And we've kind of already see what happens when this defense uh, plays even average quarterbacks. And then of course, NC state, it's going to be um, a huge rivalry game. And um, um, I think Devin Leary has uh, a lot of potential running an offense. So um, I'm worried as the quarterbacks get better, because I don't think Tyler Van Dyke uh, presented <laughs> too many problems and he, he didn't even have uh, oh, he did although he did present 35 points worth of problems <laughs> yeah he, pre he presented five touchdowns worth of problems yeah and uh it's it is crazy to hear like you see 42 points on the scoreboard and you're like the defense didn't play that bad and I think the the pro football grades kind of reflect that where everybody is either in the green um very close to the green or you know, you have a few outliers like um, like a Kyler McMichael who's down at uh, thirty seven point four. So I think you could kind of pinpoint where some of these problems are coming from um, defensively. 
And one thing that people keep saying about this defense, EJ, is that they're close. They're, they're close to turning it around and you just have one or two guys, a few plays where, where they've been close for three years. Yep. That's, that's a, that's a <laughs> great point that I was going to follow up with where <laughs> we're saying how close this Carolina defense is to turning it around. But when you're at the point in year three of the same systems, how, how much longer can you be saying that the defense is close and that they're, they're right on the doorsteps of kind of figuring it out. In the words of uh, the great coach, they are who we thought they are, and we cannot let them off the hook. I'm not going to let these guys off the hook. As you can see, we have talent in place in this defense. It is the discipline. It, I don't, I, and, and, I, and I really don't know. I mean, as a guy who had the strength coach that Mike and I had and Jeff Connors and some of the coaches that we had, discipline what was the thing that you had to have to get on the field they will put a guy out there who's going to do all the right things who may not be the best athlete who may not be the most talented guy but if he's going to go out there and not lose the game for you and make the plays that he's supposed to make that fall right in his lap then those are going to be the guys to get on the field and at this point it just seems like some of these guys, the, the talent, it just seems to override it. I mean, you have we have our guys, our handful of guys that go out there and they're playing consistently every week. Jeremiah Gimmel, um, Jaquarius Conley. Um, we have uh, Rava Hasek, Miles Murphy. Tamon Fox, I think, is having a hell of a year. Kimon Rucker's really coming on for us. And, and Cedric Giovanni, Big, Giovanni Biggers has shown flashes. Yeah, Giovanni Biggers, he, he really has. I mean, he'll come up and he'll hit. Like I said, I mean, we were just talking about him last week. I mean, he's he's doing that number 27. A lot. He's doing it very well. He's doing the justice, I think, for the, for the guy that we know who wore and that being Deontay Williams. So, um, but I, I, I really don't know what else to say. I mean, there this this is the defense that we're going to have. I don't think that, that there's no more coming along. There's no more growing pains. There's no more grace period. I mean, we kind of gave these guys as much grace as we could about not executing and missing tackles. So it's not the defensive scheme. When we go out there and we execute, I mean, and I'll I'll give the the guys credit. Our games and twist up front were way more effective than they have ever been. I mean, guys like Dez Evans actually look like an elite pass rusher just from some of the bend and some of the get-off that I saw uh, from him yesterday. Tamari Fox even played on the edge and had some great rush. So we have talent in these places. It's just that Talent doesn't mean anything if talent's not going to be disciplined. Are we going to go out there and keep our eyes on our luggage? As you guys mentioned, we have a lot of trouble with, with, with plays coming out of the backfield, whether it be a wide, whether it be a running back leaking, whether it be a quarterback scrambling on, on third and 10 just to get extra yards. And that's where we really probably saw Van Dyke be um, his most successful yesterday. He was just, I mean, we, we just were in a spread defense. I remember that on the fourth and 10, we were in a spread defense. There was a great pass rush, but you can't, you can't rush the passer that aggressively if you only have three men down and everybody else is back with their heels on the um, on the yard to gain. So it's just little small things like that that I just don't see where we're really being refined or, or really playing, be, being mental, cerebral players like some of the guys that I know who are the greats. I mean, you have to know that situation. You have to be able to play situational football. And, that, and that's the place where we're really struggling, like I, like like the defensive line has to know that you have to must rush on that play. You have to, yeah, put pressure on him to make him uncomfortable. But if he's just, if he wants to scramble, you have to be able to tackle him. And I mean, we're, we're not playing against the guy who's running a four, four or four five. I mean, that guy's probably honestly Tom Brady level athleticism when it comes to scrambling away from the pocket. But unfortunately we, he put up Tom Brady like numbers. He, like Mike mentioned, he scored 35 points. And I mean, that, I mean, that, 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 that's very discouraging, even though, yeah, we played well, but to, to give up that amount of points is still discouraging. So I don't think that we there, there's not no more waiting. There's no more grace period. This is the defense that we have. And we just have to figure out uh, these guys have to get together be, between the ears because we obviously have a, a more talented defense than we had in years in Carolina. So that's the only thing I really can say to explain it. It really baffles me. To, to see us make plays like this and then go miss a tackle and, and then see guys like Jaquarius Conley go and make a p- tackle on the screen and the next play, he, he takes a bad angle. I mean, it, it's pretty much the same play, so why aren't we doing the same thing? So I, I really don't know how to explain it. We have what we have, and they are who we, th- who we thought they were. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's my biggest concern, um, especially on the defensive side of the ball, is that the same issues keep popping up and the level of – the talent on this team is not matching the production. And it was, that was something I said after Saturday. And 
Uh, I, I know somebody on the message board was like, like, where do you see like this talent coming from that's not producing because I don't see it. And, and I understand people think that Mac Brown needs time to get his recruits in, but you can't tell me that teams like Georgia Tech and Florida State and Miami have this drastic talent advantage over Carolina. Like these are still power five players. Everybody's on scholarship. Everybody has the talent to kind of produce. So it's something where if, if it's the same thing that keeps popping up and you're not getting physically overmatched, it's, it's something that you would expect to kind of get cleaned up over time. But Mike, a positive on offense, positivity pod, was Carolina look to establish the run early and often after the success they had last year on the ground against Miami? Now, it was always going to be hard to replicate what Michael Carter and Javante Williams did last year in Hard Rock yeah. Stadium, but Carolina, 228 rushing yards, 104 for Todd Chandler, 98 for Sam Howell. What allowed for Carolina to be successful and effective on, on the ground running the ball? Yeah, I mean, and I'll, and I'll go ahead and say this now. I mean, I've made a lot of comparisons between this running back group and Javante and Michael Carter, and, and I, I want to clarify that there is no comparison between Javante and Michael Carter, and we're not going to live in the past on this podcast. I mean, that's just the way that it is. What we have now is like what EJ said. We, we have who we have, and they are who we think they are. The good news is that Ty Chandler and DJ Green are getting substantially better every single week. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, Ty is going to move on next year. We've got Earl Hood, Caleb Hood's, Earl Hood's kid, Caleb Hood coming up behind him, who I think is going to be a really good player. Um, I, you know, with, between him and DJ, I think we got two running backs next season. I don't want to look ahead. Just like I want to live in the past, I don't want to live in the future either. But I think that next year we've got two kids that are going to be really good, and there's not going to be much drop-off from the production we're seeing from Ty Chandler, who is turning into the player, like we talked about a few weeks ago, is turning into the player that I thought he would probably turn into once he – developed some comfort level with his offensive line and developed comfort level with Sam Howell um, and, and really started to grasp and understand the broader scheme of the offense. I mean, he's a guy who produced a lot at Tennessee. He's a good football player. He's a very well-rounded football player, which makes him dangerous in a lot of different phases. And we're starting to use him a little more in that capacity, although I would like to see him use as a receiver a lot more than we currently are. He's shown an ability to catch the ball and, 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 and to score in the open field. I mean, we, we know he can do that. But in terms of actually ground and pound on the ground, things looked good for us in the running game early on. What concerns me, um, you know, to, to veer off the positivity pod now, let's, 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 get, let's, let's come back to reality a little bit. What concerns me is, Time and time again, week after week, and possession after possession in this game, particularly in the second half, we have shown a very uncomfortable inability to get one or two yards in short yardage for a first down when we absolutely have to have it. We are, you know, the run game looks good because early in the, in the game, and then throughout the remainder of the game, when we did have production in the running game, they were chunk plays. We're getting 9, 10, 11 yards on the ground, seven, anywhere between 7 and 12 yards on a rush, whether that be from Sam, Ty Chandler, DJ, somebody. Um, that is not sustainable. The real concern is, and you know you have a good running game, when you can line up in second and one, and it's a guaranteed first down. You can line up and run almost whatever you want to run if you hand that ball off, and you know you're going to get a yard. We literally cannot do that, and it's not like I don't think we can do it. There is example after example after example of second and one, second and two, third and one, where we can't get a single yard, and we need two bites at the same apple to get that first down. So unless we're breaking off a chunk play in the run game, we're having a real hard time of moving the sticks using the running game. That's concerning to me. Even more concerning is on your second and short plays, second and one, second and two, second and three, we can't move the sticks on second down. We're having to use what seems like, unless we blow it open on first down, unless we convert a first down on our first down play, and we're ahead of the sticks, we're ahead of schedule, we, it seems we need all three downs in order to get a first down when we decide to stick to the run and we commit to the run on any given drive. And that's concerning. It's concerning because teams can line up, stack the box on you on second and short, and if they're lucky, you're going to run the ball. More times than not, they're going to be right. And because they've stacked the box, 
Well, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. A good team can get a yard even against a stacked box, and we can't. The other concern is we have – I mean, and I'm not going to criticize Phil on this a lot because I think he calls good games overall. I think, I think, his, I think Phil Longo's game plans generally are good. There are, just as we talked about last year, like in the Florida State game last year down in Tallahassee and in games past in previous seasons, there are situations where play calling in situational football is lacking. We had, we had a third and I want to say nine right by the middle of the field. We absolutely needed the first down to keep the drive alive. I think it was – I don't know if it was at the end of the third quarter or when it was, or the end of maybe it was the end of second half or first half. And what we ran was a direct snap to Sam, who then just took off. It was almost like a quarterback sneak out of the shotgun. And I got two yards, like terrific. I got two yards because it was an obvious passing situation. And he managed to get two yards because he basically fell for two yards. But he took the snap, took off on a dead sprint as soon as he got the ball right up the middle fell for two yards and now it's fourth and seven or fourth and six or whatever it ended up being. And it made absolutely no sense in that circumstance. And you saw Mac come over to Phil, you know, and have a, what, what was that moment with him? Um, Those are the types of things that, that concern me. You know, we can't seem to get a yard or two in short yardage situations. And then in your, and in, and then in third and I mean, third and nine, third and eight is behind the sticks. It's behind schedule, but it is manageable. So on third and a manageable situation, we're running essentially a quarterback sneak out of the shotgun. And what is obviously a passing situation, run a screen, put a ball in a playmaker's hands. We love to run these tunnel screens with Josh Downs and they're typically pretty productive. One of them got blown up yesterday, but for the most part this year, he's had a couple go for touchdowns. You know, why are we not running things like that? And I don't like to second guess, Coaches, I'm not an offensive coordinator. I never have been. I don't want to be. Okay. Phil is. He gets paid a lot of money to be. And like I said, for the most part, he calls very good games. And he has. Everywhere he's been, he's called good games. He's, he's had productive offensive. He's had big-name players come out of those offenses. But, for example, third and nine quarterbacks, if, if effectively a quarterback sneak out of the shotgun, I don't know what that is. Second and one, we can't get a first down. I don't know what that is. And we've got to get that fixed because we've still got five games in the season. If Carolina wants to make a bowl game, and that's where I'm at at this point, if they want to make a bowl game, they absolutely must start converting on things like that. They have to be able to get a yard. The offense has to have the kind of identity where it can get a yard when it needs a yard. And right now it can't. It can get 12 yards or it can get negative one yards or it can get zero yards, but it can't seem to get one yard they got to get that fixed immediately and that is just that's an attitude issue sometimes it's a play calling issue third and nine quarterback sneak out of the shotgun that's a play calling issue second and one in the middle of the field all you gotta do is get one yard on the ground that's an attitude problem they need to find it and i say that in a game as a as a small criticism in a game where i thought the attitude of the team was a complete and total 180 from what it was against florida state that's another point we talked about last week. There was no fire. There was no pop. There was no real, there was no gumption about that team against Florida State. And I hadn't really seen a type of fire, nothing. There was no catalyst, it seemed, on the sideline to really get these guys fired up, ready to go out there. You know, like they, didn't, they weren't playing mean. They weren't playing with attitude. They were just playing. They were trying to out-scheme teams. It was, a very, it was a finesse kind of team. That was my criticism last week. This week, that was not the problem. If they can keep the, the general attitude they had and then clean up things like, like second and short, third and short on offense, come up with interceptions when it hits them right in the hands, Don Chapman. You know, take better angles on defense, but maintain the attitude that they had. I think the remainder of this season, I will be proven way wrong on the ultimate result by the end of the season than what I'm thinking right now, what I'm predicting right now, which I don't even want to say on the air because I'll get absolutely destroyed on the internet and I don't feel like dealing with it. Yeah, so that's I where I am. I took your positive and I turned it to a negative because I'm a good <laughs> Irish Catholic. That's what we do. Yeah, I think when you're talking about the uh, the fire of this team, I think one thing that helps is seeing somebody like Sam Howell who is bouncing off would-be tacklers and he's playing with this chip on his shoulder like Carolina. Well, and, he's, and he's noticeably frustrated. Part of yeah. the chip is he's just pissed. Yeah, and yeah. it's just like 
it's at the point right now where it's almost like get on my back. I'm going to try to do everything possible to win this game for Carolina. But how how much of the the offense you mentioned? It's it's a lot of all or nothing, and then at the end of the game, uh, they punt it. Not counting the last drive where they kneel it, they punt it on four of their last five possessions. How much of that do you think is a result of it being such a predictable attack where it's either you're going to Josh Downs, you're running Sam Howell, or you have some kind of uh, run concept sprinkled in. And that's almost like the afterthought in this offense. And you don't really have to worry about uh, maybe two or two or three other options that are out on the field because they're, they're not getting targeted. And I, I get it. It is a small criticism when you're scoring 45 points, but I think this also just speaks to, the overall talent and the overall uh, potential that this offense does have. I mean, everything with this offense. Yeah. So, so let me, let me take that point. And I've had this thought. We are completely and totally one dimensional, depending on which dimension we're employing. So if we're in the run game, we're pretty one dimensional in the run game. If we're, if we're dropping back, I use that in air quotes, all right. If we're in the shotgun, all right. And that ball is coming to Sam's shoulder and he's about to throw that ball. We're pretty one dimensional in the passing game too. We're pretty easy to figure out. What's incredible is we can still put up 45 points by being completely and totally one-dimensional and predictable. I mean, it's remarkable. It's, it's the point you made in Positivity Pod. He, this offense is explosive when it has to be, even when you know what's coming. Even when you know who's getting the ball, we can still beat you. Imagine if we had options to sprinkle that ball around to Imagine if like Bo Nix hitting 10 different receivers yesterday, Sam Howell could hit 10 different receivers like he did last year. You know, when he had multiple options on the outside, when he had Daz and he had, he had Diami and he had, you know, Garrett Walston was productive when he needed to be right. Bo he Corrales had early. Bo, Bo Corrales early on. I mean, he had options, All right? Josh Downs sprinkled in every once in a while, right? Antoine green, we get a, or Antoine green. We get a couple of, you know, a couple catches, you know, every game when he actually caught the ball. I mean, that kind of thing. Like he had, he had options and he could spread the ball around. And then obviously Javante and Michael Carter and, you know, as extensions of the run game or, in, you know, for screens or, you know, little, little snap routes and stuff like that. I mean, he was, Sam had a ton of options. The offense was humming, you know, it wasn't the offense last year that had me concerned on whether we could win the football game Ex- with the exception of Florida state. Um, this year is a totally different animal. We've got one option in the pass game. Although I think we've got two or three. Um, two of them are coming out of the backfield. DJ Green and Ty Chandler. Um, I think Kamari Morales can be, a, can be another option. So there's a tight end, but we don't really seem to hit him much. And I'm going to tell you why I think that is. And offensive guys, I'm sure, have keyed in on this. Taylor, I'm sure you've seen it. And EJ, I'm sure you've figured it out too, being a defensive player. Sam has one read, and when that read's not there, he's running the football. Yeah. Or he's throwing a pick, a bubble screen, okay? Or, the, or the, you know, the little, little, we just call that a zombie route, you know, the little, little swing route out there. I mean, that's, that's it. Like, he's got one read. It's either going to be an interception, an incompletion, or Sam's running the ball. But if you take that away, all he's doing is tucking and running. Now, Teams haven't quite figured out how to stop Sam tucking and running consistently. They have once in a while. But when his first option's covered, he's got nowhere to go. That, and fans don't necessarily want to hear this, has been an issue for three years. Sam, I don't know, is being taught to read defenses at the level he's going to need to know them and to play well in the NFL. I don't think most college quarterbacks are being taught at the college level how to read defenses the way it's necessary to succeed in the NFL. Um, But I don't watch most college quarterbacks. I watch Sam, and I watch this offense for the most part. Um, That being said, Sam is very intelligent. And when he has multiple reads, and you can see him working through progressions sometimes, he knows how to work through a progression. He knows how to get the ball where it's got to go. But if a play is designed to hit a primary option because it's a timing type of play, and we run a lot of timing plays in the pass game, you know, where it's ball snapped, balls in Sam's hands, one, two, three, balls out right now, that's a single read type of play, and we run a lot of those. 
And when that single read's not there, there could be other options, but you know, they're designed to spread the defense to create space for that primary option. They're not designed as a safety valve. They're not really designed to be there as a secondary or a third option. Sam's got to tuck and run and that's it. So now you're just playing, you're playing two man football all the time with Sam and whatever receivers, his primary read that is not sustainable. It's certainly not going to be, it's not going to work against anybody who's on this schedule moving forward. I mean, no one, who do we got left? We got wake. We got Notre Dame. We got Pittsburgh. We got state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yikes. Every one of those teams defensively is going to know exactly what to do to stop Sam. Okay. Every one of those teams is really good. Yeah. I'm going to give state their due state can play. And you're going to, and you know, they come with juice like states coming in to rip our head off. Can we bleep that out? Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, look, man, I'm like, you gotta, sometimes you gotta give the devil their due. Dave Dorn and his terrible cowboy boots. Like you gotta give them nah. their due. Nah. But state's really good. Pittsburgh, Pat and has got that team humming. Those guys can play and they're mean and they play hard. They play like a, you know, like a Pennsylvania football team would play. Finally. I mean, it only took them forever. You know, it only took them since the eighties to figure that out again. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got a tough schedule moving forward. So when you're one dimensional in the running game, we're going to, we're running, we're running in the run game. We're running in two gaps. We're running in the a gap and probably not getting many yards and we're running off tackle, not even really outside. Again, it's these tight stretches. We're running more like 16 and 17 type stretch plays, you know, we're inside, inside hip of the tackle, just that or inside hip of the tight end, that kind of stuff. We're not running true stretch plays. Like we're not really getting the ball out on the perimeter. So when we run the ball, it's basically staying between the tackles or right off the tackles hip. When we're throwing the ball, it's going to one guy or Sam's going to run it. That's what we are. And if you go into a game as a defensive coordinator with that game plan against Carolina, you are going to be right 78 to 82% of the time. Those are just, I'm making those numbers up three out of four times. Sounded right to me. Yeah. Three out of four (laughs) times. It sounded smart. Three out of four times. You're going to be right. You know, sex Panther, 60% of the time it works every time. (laughs) <laughs> so ej there's uh there's a lot of things you could talk about defensively but the the star of the game for the defense cedric gray you mentioned him early where since carolina's inserted him into the starting lineup he's he's made a, a tremendous impact on the field this game against uh, miami he had six tackles a tackle for a loss uh the pass breakup where, like you mentioned, he was running stride for stride with a receiver down into the end zone. He has his first career interception where uh, he's the beneficiary of a Tony Grimes pass breakup. He's in the right spot, nice hands uh, with the interception. And of course he has the game ceiling interception uh, where Jeremiah Gemmel comes through, gets his hand up in his pass rush, deflects the ball right into not right into Cedric Gray's hand because that ball was kind of bouncing around for hours, like Mac Brown said. But what do you like about what Gray brings to this team? And then I guess how encouraging is it that this defense does have a lot of young talent in their sophomore year when you look at Gray, Conley, Grimes, Murphy, Des Evans, where there there is a young core that you can build around if the players – theoretically uh, progress and develop like you would expect them to? I would say the, the first thing that stands out, and I think I'll just go ahead and attack the obvious, is, is elite athleticism. When you can put somebody with that type of athleticism at the linebacker spot, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that he can do. But I think that the second part of my compliment to him is really really what sets him apart. He's an elite, he, he's just an elite linebacker, I, I think. I mean, and you can really see it in the way he's developing from week to week. If he makes a mistake, the same mistakes that he made his first game starting, he's not making those mistakes anymore. We've gotten on – one of our points over the last few weeks has been, what, why aren't we seeing the development of these players? Why aren't we seeing the Dez Evans and guys like that step up? Why aren't we seeing the wide receivers on offense who show so much promise and potential step up the way that, that Josh Downs is kind of stepping up this year? Do they, they don't have his athleticism, but still, we're not seeing these guys step up. But with Cedric, you're seeing him progress from game to game. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's going to be ACC Defensive Player of the Week. If not, then I'll personally go and buy him a trophy and, and a plaque and mail it to him myself because 
because, I mean, he played lights out. And like you mentioned, I mean, even on that last interception, you have to give – I mean, on both of those interceptions, yeah, Tony Grimes made the first play, but – Jer- but he was in the right place. He was where he was supposed to be in his coverage to be the beneficiary of that play. That's how that's called playing team football. This, this is not a sport where a guy can one guy can come and take over a game. He's making plays because the other 10 guys are doing what they're supposed to do and vice versa. The, the end of the game. I mean, Jeremiah has the consciousness to put his hands up in his pass rush if he knows he's not going to get there to get to the quarterback. Once again, he's in the right place at the right time and shows athleticism and a little bit of hands by, by scooping up that interception show. You, you, you can't help but love what he's doing. And I mean, again, I started out with my takeaways with talking about Cedric Gray and Miles, and Miles Murphy. Our that, that sophomore class is unbelievable. I think that all those guys are going to be, I think they have the potential to be first team all ACC players. I really, the, when I look at those guys, it really reminds me of back in the day when we had Greg Ellis and Ebenezer Agabon and all those guys and around the pep era where we just had all those first round and second round, Dre Bly, all those first and second round picks because we had so many elite players on defense. And I think that those guys can grow to be that. I mean, Tony Grimes, yeah, he had his struggles yesterday, but you're talking about a kid that was supposed to be playing high school football last year and the way he played and even the way he's playing now. Yeah, he's having some growing pains, but he's still a young kid and I still like what I see. 70% of the time, I think he's making the right thing it's just that when he makes a mistake it's very noticeable and tony grimes frame out there at corner is unbelievable oh exactly i mean you just see him that, in kid, his is a, that, 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 kid, that, that kid is a creative player at corner yeah. he, 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 he has he has the jalen ramsey type imposing bill when he goes out there against the against wide receivers but i i think one thing that i'm really seeing is cedric gray i mean i really think that he's still the star of this class because I think he's going to be that Jeremiah Gimble type player. When Jeremiah Gimble has gone on to play in the NFL with, from everything I saw sat, uh, Saturday, I think, I, I think he got himself drafted. I mean, I mean, he probably was going to be drafted anyway, but I think his position sliding higher because everything he did from his coverage, from the way he was going on blitzes to the, like you said, the heads up play to stick his hands up uh, when he was rushing and ended up being a game saving interception. Those are the things that you see linebackers doing. And especially these linebackers in the NFL these days who can, just do everything I mean that's really what you're seeing so I think Cedric Gray is saying that he's going to be the guy that that has the talent and is getting his playing time right now and is making an immediate impact as a sophomore where he's really getting the most of his snaps and he's going to come in and be a leader he's going to be in all be in all these situations when we start seeing some of these guys like Ra Ra Dilworth like Power Eccles come up and start Power Eccles out there rocking a cowboy collar by the way with like no gloves is just I, 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 th- I think he needs it the way he's out there laying guys out he Dude, that kid, needs that cowboy I think, collar I don't know how we're going to figure out how to get how we're going to get Cedric Ra Ra and Power Eccles, by the way, three Cedric Ra Ra and Power. Like, what a what a great linebacker! Yeah. I don't in you know, a two linebackers. And we're we're running we're running a four two. I don't know how we're going to get those guys out there, but uh, I hope we, we figure out to. how to get all three of those guys on the field at the same time. Ra Ra might, might, might end up being a stand up rusher. I mean, we don't we don't know what's going to happen there. Exactly. Can you imagine that defense out there with, with, with Miles up front and with um, Javari Ritzy up front goodness, with, with Keemon and Des Evans coming off the edge with, with JQ back there being a dog like he is like with Tony Grimes out there locking up everything we really have like going back to the earlier statement like the talent is there in this defense, and I really don't understand how the fans aren't seeing this. I mean, I know we know a little bit more about with seeing these young guys just because they aren't making the big interceptions. A pass breakup is a great play, too. I mean, these guys are just out there making plays, and it is coming from that sophomore core. And But I, I still think I, I'm high on very high on Miles Murphy, very high on Cedric Gray. With I think Cedric Gray is going to be – I think he's going to be that standout leader. I think he's going to be the stalwart, stalwart of that defense is just the guy who's going to be there making plays constantly on all ACs teams and have the chance to really I, I think with, with the way that I think these players can develop if we really see that I think that this is a team that can be playing some big time football before these guys leave Carolina Mike I wanted to ask you about um, a situation uh, right before the half where Carolina attempts the the 50 plus field goal for Grayson Atkins and Mac Brown has shown a ton of confidence in Grayson Atkins he's Um, just one of seven now in field goals plus, uh, 50 yards or longer. If you're out there, how do you determine if that three points is, is, um, worth it to attempt that field goal when you, your kicker is one of six going into that attempt compared to if you miss, you're giving a team like Miami, um, 
a lot of momentum and the chance to work with a short field in a game where they were kind of looking for anything um, to kind of grasp onto for momentum wise when you when you could put them away um, maybe by just punting and saying let's get to halftime but I it, I do want to preface it by saying that it is easy to play the result when we're talking about this after he misses the kick and you're you're starting to think about all the other possible outcomes um, kickers are strange birds there's only uh, they're they're like quarterbacks if you think about this there's only one place kicker on a roster that's going to be on the field at any time. Just like there's only one quarterback. Um, when you get to the NFL, there's really only one place kicker. There's one punter, and one of them also does your kickoffs. So you got two kickers and a long snapper. That's your special teams in the NFL. College, it's the same thing. you got some backups. you got other guys who might be walk-ons that are on the roster. But you really only have, for all intents and purposes, you got one kicker, one punter, and a long snapper. You as a coach, don't want to do anything to mess with that kid's psyche. Showing him, showing him that you're confident in him despite his failures is the most surefire way to keep that kid tight mentally. Because when you need him, if he's tight mentally down the road, when you really need him, not when you're just trying to tack on some extra points onto, you know, onto a drive and extend a lead, but like when you need a game winner, at some point, that kid's going to come through for you, and it's going to be because he knew his coach believed in him. Um, kicking is very mental. I, Connor Barth, Casey Barth, these guys will tell you this stuff. I mean, kicking is a very – it's as much mental as it is physical. Um, that I, – I don't know what was being communicated to him in practice either this week or in any week of practice leading up to this. What I can tell you is that my assumption would be Mac has stayed positive with him and has shown him throughout the week that I'm going to depend on you when the moment calls for it. And I know you're going to be able to deliver for me, or I'm confident that you can deliver for me in that moment. That's why he put him out there and he, they kicked that field goal. And boy, did he miss that field goal. But yeah. he came back later. And he made another one. Okay. We needed some points. He connected. Right. That's just that that's the game you play. I mean, it's a it's a it's 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 a give and a take. And look, this kid came from Furman. He was an all American at Furman. Right. He was he was he was a great kicker at a lower level. Um, he's now playing for a Hall of Fame coach at a much higher level in a much more difficult conference and a much more difficult setting. Um, and he hasn't produced the way that I think he's he's used to producing. But the truth of the matter is that they know he can. He's on scholarship. They got to use him. And the only way you're going to, you know, you you got you to keep him confident. And he's shown an ability to do what he needs to do when he needs to do it. Now, 50 plus, clearly not his bag, of, you know, not, not his cup of tea. Um, but he has shown an ability to get you the points that you need when you need them in the gimme, the gimme situations. Um, I think Mac, based on what I would have to assume he's communicating to him in practice, wanted to be a man of his word and show the kid that he had confidence in him no matter what. And points there is, you know, arguably better than punting. Um, you know, you take a risk. Mac has shown that he's willing to roll the dice. I mean, two years ago, Miami at home, fourth and 16 to win the game. Like, he's willing to roll the dice. Like, he'll do it. He's into the analytics and all that stuff. So, you know, he was chasing points. It didn't work out for us that time. At some point in the remainder of the season, we'll chase points and it will work out for us. Same as it's the exact same philosophy as going for two instead of kicking the extra point. You know, sometimes you just you just go for it and you see what happens. I think that's I think that's where we are. But mostly it's I think it's a confidence thing and staying true to his word, depending on the messaging that you're giving to that kicker throughout the week. Um, you know, kickers are strange birds. Kicking is very mental and they need to know that, you know, their coaching staff is confident in them. And I think that's what you saw. Yeah, it also didn't wind up hurting the team as uh, Van Dyke threw an interception. I think like two plays later, um, but Atkins, like I mentioned, he's two of seven from 50 plus inside 50, uh, that 40 to 49 range. He is three of five and knocked one down uh, yesterday, but everybody's favorite part of the podcast, say something nice. We're coming, we're coming off a win here. EJ, get us, get us started into the bye week. Say something nice about this team. 
I will say this, um, and I, it kind of is really kind of summing up everything that I've been talking about on the pod today, and is that that we finally have the talent in place to win and be competitive in football games. We have the defensive scheme. I think I think we have the talent in place to fit our defensive scheme. We have the prototype players to run the type of defense that we run. We need to just need to get it together mentally and kind of fine tune some things and flush out some of the garbage. But I do like I do like where this talent is headed. And, and, and it really positivity pod. I do have to say this. It really sucks to still be talking potential in year three of this coaching regime. But I do think that they have delivered on the type of talent that they said they were going to bring to Chapel Hill. This mm-hmm. is the type of talent we need to be competitive mm-hmm. in the ACC and on a national stage with just a few more pieces. So that's my positivity for the day. I think we are a better overall talented team. And I think we are going in the right direction to really win and play big time football, i.e. in the college football playoffs. Mike, what about you? What's your say something nice? Uh, my biggest thing against Florida State was we didn't show any fire. And I think these guys really – they showed they got some stink about them this week on offense and defense. Mm-hmm. There was, they were competing on both sides of the ball. So, you know, on offense, the play that I think of is when Sam rushed for that touchdown, got laid out from behind, which, by the way, that's going to hurt today, mm-hmm. um, as, you know, from their safety as he's coming into the end zone scoring. And he just slams the ball down. He's chest bumping dudes. He's, he, I mean, you can see him. He's fired up in a way you hadn't seen him fired up. I think a lot of that was frustration pouring over. Um, but the enti- that, that, that got the entire team jacked up. Like that play. And that, that response from their leader quarterback got the whole team jacked up. On the defensive side of the ball, Miles Murphy, you call hands of the face all you want. Look, I'm an offensive lineman. The hands of the face didn't happen until the end of that play. Mm-hmm. And that was a BS call because that kid got embarrassed. Don't bail them out from their right guard getting absolutely embarrassed. Miles the, Murphy was was a man child. In the words of Ron play. Cherry, he was giving him the business. He was giving him the business. <laughs> Personal foul. Um, there was that play. And then there was later on, I mean, ultimately, they, they, they ended up scoring a touchdown, I think, or they converted. Oh, uh, that's what it was. They converted fourth and 21, I think it might have been. Mm-hmm. But the couple plays leading up to that, Tony Grimes is batting balls out of the, you know, great play in the end zone, great coverage in the end zone, made a super athletic play. It was a great throw. It was one of those 50-50 situations where we lose a lot of those. Tony Grimes knocked that ball down, okay, drew the incompletion. We had a couple, We had a play right before that. I saw guys bouncing around, um, throwing fists in the air. I mean, everybody was just jacked up to the nines. Mm-hmm. There was just an attitude where it was like, ooh, like, I mean, it was, it was it, that kind of stuff. I don't care what people say is intimidating. When you got a whole defense out there barking like dogs, that is intimidating for an offense. Now, granted, <laughs> we screwed up. We didn't finish the job. They converted a fourth and freaking 21 and then scored a touchdown, but they did everything right up to that point. Huge sack by Giovanni Bickers, huge pass breakup by Tony Grimes. Everybody's out there hitting, cutting, and crushing skulls. It is on both sides of the ball. I saw that stink. I saw that fire. It's there. They need to keep it through the bye week, right, and come in. And if they play like that against Notre Dame and they clean up some other things, maybe we get surprised. Notre Dame is a very good football team, but they've got their own issues, particularly on the offensive line. This is not a Notre Dame offensive line that we've seen in the past. They've got a lot of new pieces, and they've struggled this year. they got their quarterback hurt, for one, which is what I've been saying we need to make sure we, we do not do. Notre Dame did it. So, you know, we've got an opportunity to, re- to you know, to, to really make a statement against Notre Dame and maybe pull this season kind of out of the out of the toilet a little bit for us, which is crazy. We got a winning record, you know, but the expectations were so high. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, this this season so far, doesn't it just it just hasn't met them. It doesn't feel like the success it should have been. But a bowl game, a win in South Bend, you know, the team showing that it's got some fire and some gumption in it, you know, and, and correcting the mistakes it made early in the year. I don't care when they get corrected. So long as they get corrected. I call that a win at this point. Yeah. I also, uh, the, the play you were talking about with Sam Howell scoring the rushing touchdown, that's the, the result of that play after was offsetting penalties, um, with a Miami player and a Carolina offensive lineman. I think if you're on the coaching staff, or at least if I was on the coaching staff, that's a penalty I could live with where an offensive lineman Mm -hmm. is getting chippy and having Sam's back when, 
you know Miami, they're they're talking smack down there. Sam's getting into it. If if you're an offensive lineman, they better have his back. He got him NIL money out of that commercial he did for the roofing company. <laughs> He's taking less money, showing showing yeah. love to everybody, man. Pay yeah, the guys. You, be, you better have guys. his back. You, you better get ejected for that kid. <laughs> so I think if you're part of this coaching staff, that's a penalty. You could you don't want to say you could live with it, but you're you could essentially live with it where um it's it's guys having each other's back and it's not like um it's not just like mental lapses and the pre and post play penalties that we've kind of seen before for this team but um my say something nice i was gonna say we're not the sinking ship that's miami um but i'm gonna go even more positive than that but i just wanted to note carolina missed 10 tackles miami missed 23 like that was a terrible tackling team. Uh, but my say something nice is, is the receiving touchdowns that you see from Carolina. Josh Downs, he's scored a touchdown now in eight straight games. It's, it's every Saturday or whenever Carolina is playing. Sometimes it's on a Friday. Um, against Pittsburgh, it's going to be a Thursday. You can, you can almost pencil in Josh Downs for a touchdown at this point. And sometimes it's, it's a 40-yard bomb. Sometimes it's a, a two-yard tunnel screen that he takes the entire way and then it's it's the tight ends for Carolina uh Copenhaver is the latest tight end to get in the end zone where it's it's like the uh the Oprah video where she's like you get a car you get a car it's if you're a tight end right now everybody this, gets a touchdown <laughs> if you're a tight end right now for Carolina you're going into game week like there's a good chance I'm gonna score it's it's Garrett Walton scored, Nesbitt scored, Morales has scored a, a ton for this team, and now Copenhaver, where it's like, if I'm if I'm a tight end, and you know the the tight ends have been kind of a talk of uh, a lack of production coming into this year, and Coach Longo not uh, utilizing them to their maximal potential, but I think you're seeing this year like the tight ends have a place in this Carolina offense, and if if players are out there executing the tight ends are going to be a huge beneficiary of, of this offense. And it's, it's always awesome to see a player get their first touchdown, but guys, that's all I got this week. Carolina heads into a much needed bye week before making a trip to South Bend right around Halloween. Always a pleasure. Can't wait till we do this again. Yes, sir. See you guys.